All right, so let's talk about the HTTP headers. And uh, good, okay, I'm just rearranging my screen a bit. All right, so here's some examples of the headers. Um, there's a connection header that tells it whether to preserve the connection for more requests, what kind of encoding is used. For example, you can zip content. Uh, you tell it how long the content is and what type it is and how it might be encoded for transfer. These are the sort of things you'll see in headers. And uh, in request headers, you tell it what kind of content you want to accept and what kind of encoding you want. You can choose a built-in HTTP authentication type like basic authentication. And you can send cookies. You have to specify the host. This is the only one that's actually required. And you can tell it um, that you only want to get a new copy of the page if it has modified since a previous date. And a few other ones here that you don't see that often. But the ones you use a lot are like user agent and referrer. If you mentioned referrer before, that supposedly tells you what page you're coming from, although it is not reliable. And the user agent is really quite important because a lot of people now use cell phones and tablets. And that's what the user agent will tell you. And a modern web page should be responsive. It will notice if you're on a small device and then serve you a different page that will fit better on your device. Another fun use of user agent is a lot of people try to get free advertising from Google. So what they do is when you go to the page, they say, oh, you have to make an account and log in to see this stuff. But when Google's indexer views the page, it shows them everything. So if you change your user agent to Google, it will let you see pages that it wouldn't let a normal person see. But yes, all of these can be spoofed easily. These are all just plain text lines in a request. You can change them to anything you want. You can even inject code into them and special characters and such. So none of it, nothing in a request header can be trusted. We'll do it all the time. If you use a tool like Burp, you can change these to be anything. And the response headers are sent by the server. And uh, they just give you information about the data it's sending you, like an expire to tell you how long to put it in the cache. Uh, and uh, these are not that common things here. Set cookie we've talked about. And uh, there's also access control allow origin and X frame options that we'll talk about a little later, which help prevent this content from being used in unexpected ways by the browser, like to cover up other content. So cookies are the heart of all this. Um, almost all session handling uses cookies. So cookies are really important. So you set a cookie with a response uh, the server sets a cookie with tracking equals something here. So now you have a value called tracking and the, the contents of it are this long string. So now your user, your browser will store that. And every time you send a request to the same domain, it will add this to the header so that the server has an opportunity by reading that to see who you are from now on. And even if you don't log in, most servers still set cookies on you just to record the fact that you have been here before and they might want to personalize the page or sell ads to you based on what you looked at last time. And almost every website now has third party um, cookies from Google or DoubleClick, which is a company Google bought to keep track of what you're doing. Hello. So uh, you got expiration we've talked about and you can specify the domain for which the cookie is valid. So it won't be the main domain, it could be a subdomain. And that is the main security feature of the model is the browser's same origin policy where cookies only go to the same company that set them. And it turns out that there are many, many flaws with the same origin policy. And this uh, is an example of something you see over and over again in security. Somebody invents a technology like VLANs, virtual local area networks, they trumpet it as a security measure then when they roll it out, it turns out people can easily circumvent it. So they say, oh, that was never intended to be a security measure. And it was the same thing with the same origin policy. Cookies are per session or per user. Uh, they can be um, anything in principle that the server chooses to use them for. But typically, they are per session. But as I say, these days, most websites let you log in and stay logged in forever with the same cookie. And about half the websites that I've tested um, let me steal a cookie and I can keep using that cookie forever. Even if the user changes their use, their password, the old cookie will just keep working. 
It's a vulnerability that a lot of websites have. So you can specify the path for which the cookie is valid. Here's the ones we were talking about before. Secure will mean this cookie will only transmit over HTTPS and never over HTTP, which probably ought to be the default by now, but it isn't. And HTTP only means it can only be sent as part of an HTTP request and it cannot be stolen by JavaScript. So cross-site scripting attacks would not be able to steal that cookie. So both of these are good things to put on your cookies. And then you got the status code. 200 is the normal one when things work. And here's 100 is just information. And here's the various errors. 300 is not really an error. That means this page has moved and I'm sending you over there. So it doesn't really mean that something failed. But 400 means that something failed in that it couldn't find something. And 500 means the server had an error typically on a script. Now, when you're hacking into a server, 500 often means success. If you're injecting code into a server, which has a result, which no longer looks like a web page. But 400 is almost always a failure. So here's common ones. 200 OK is the most common one when things work. 301 or 302 move you to another location. Um, 304, not modified. That just means the cached copy is good enough. 400 is a bad request. 401 means you didn't provide authentication information that's required. 404 means it couldn't find something. 403 means it found it, but you're not authenticated. So you're not allowed to see it. And 500 is a script error, like a PHP error on there. So that's, there are people having a lot of fun making memes and stuff about these. Um, all right, so HTTPS is another invention of Netscape. And the point of this was to somehow encrypt stuff because the early internet did not provide any uh, any provision for this. And once people started sending up passwords and then eventually credit card numbers and stuff, they really need to encrypt that. So they embedded this HTTP over SSL. Now it uses the later uh, upgrade called TLS, but they all work about the same way. And the point of this is you get a certificate from the server that verifies who it is. Then you know who you're talking to. Then you use a public key from that server to encrypt your traffic and nobody can open it except the holder of the private key, which is never transmitted. So it's really very secure and uh, used for almost everything now on the web. Now you can have proxies where you send your request to a proxy server. It then fetches the resource and hands it back to you. And this is commonly used at companies to inspect content going out to make sure people aren't sending secrets out and to inspect content coming in to make sure it's not viruses or malware or forbidden top content like maybe games or porn and so on. So that would be a server between you and the internet. So you don't make any direct connections to the internet. Um, one of my students was setting up some proxies in a lab when we got a public direct internet address and he started turning on various proxies. And when he put a proxy, just listening on a RIP address on a normal port number within one minute, hundreds of Chinese users started surfing porn through it because in China, because of the great firewall, a lot of things are blocked. So there's a huge interest in finding proxy. So they have automatic servers scanning for an open proxy. When they find an open proxy, they immediately start sending traffic through it. So anyway, um, you can see it out there. So uh, HTTPS uses cryptography so that you send data so that only the server you are intending to talk to can understand anything you say. Everybody else will just see garbled stuff they can't decrypt unless they have an attack which defeats HTTPS and those exist, but they are rare and difficult. Um, so if you want to filter data, if I'm connecting to say Google and over HTTPS, that means my company cannot see that data. The, the company router and switches and firewall and everything will all just see encrypted garbage. But if I have a company policy that says I have to inspect all the data going out of my company and make sure it's not violating our security policy, then they have to perform man in the middle attack and HTTPS is supposed to prevent that. So you can either do a man in the middle attack and put out fake certificates and then the users will all get certificate warnings. So you will have to tell them to install a root certificate on their device, which will tell them to trust your company HTTPS server. Now that'll work. And it typically is something you'd do if all the devices are company devices. So it's easy to um, install that. The other thing you can do is let encrypted traffic through, 
Or you can do the third thing, which is bribe a certificate authority to violate the trust of their customers and sell you an authentic certificate so you can really impersonate a real certificate authority. That is not supposed to happen, but it was an open secret that people did it in about the last five years. It's come out very public that a lot of them will in fact do this, um, which kind of ruins the whole model of trusting certificate authorities, but that's the way it is. And the question I see here is very good certificate pinning would protect you from this because certificate pinning means not only do I know that the certificate came from a trusted certificate source, but I also have other information like the certificate should have this MD5 hash. So if somebody does a man in the middle attack and changes it to a different certificate, even if that certificate would normally be trusted, I will still know it's false. So let me bring some of this up in a browser. Now I'm using Brave here and I may be a little clumsy about this. Let me move my Brave over and try sharing it. Let's see if this is gonna work. This is what I tried before. Oh good, looks like it's working. So here's Kahoot. Now Kahoot looks like a secure website. If I click on this, I can see the certificate supposedly. Certificate is valid. Okay, it looks like I can see the certificate. And so um, I don't think I can make the font bigger, unfortunately, but um, I can see here this certificate is kahoot.it and it's sold to them by SecTigo, RSA Domain Validation. And that is signed by User Trust, RSA Certificate Authority, which is apparently the root of trust. Now in the browser, it'll have a list of your trusted root certificate authorities. And there's about a hundred of them. They're built in the browser. So you trust those and you trust anything with a valid signature from them. And you can have a trust chain leading from intermediate authority to the root authority. And down here, you've got the certificate and here's the details. And it would be possible to see the whole certificate depending on uh, how you get there in the browser. Ah, uh, down here it is. So here's the information. And so I have a serial number. I have the name of the company that sold the certificate. I have the algorithm, which is RSA encryption. Here's the public key, 256 bytes, all that junk. That's the magic ingredient. That is the public key, which I can use to encrypt data, which nobody can open except the holder of the private key. And the private key is supposed to be stored all the way at kahoot.it and not anywhere else. That's the plan. All right, anyway, that's the uh, way HTTPS works. And it really is very good. Nothing is perfect, but HTTPS is very good. So now I should be able to share my slides again. Good, looks like this is working. I may have gotten to the bottom of my problem here. So you send an HTTP request to the proxy, and if the proxy allows the request, it will then um, make an HTTPS connection. This is one option, and then you use HTTP on your local network, or you re-encrypt it. Anyway. Um, so basic authentication is a form that's been around for a long time. This sends usernames and password in base 64 encoding, which is not encryption. It's not a very secure process. It's a little bit different than just sending it in plain text. NTLM uses Windows NTLM using an old hashing protocol called MD4. Digest uses MD5, which is also an old. None of these are very secure. This is the worst of them all is basic. Um, they typically not used on the internet very much. Now, however, one thing that is reasonably secure is to use one of them with HTTPS. Then they have this not very secure transmission of username and password covered by HTTPS encryption, which is very good. So that's, uh, that covers a multitude of sins. And that's why, for many reasons, every website you go to should be HTTPS. If your website you go to is not HTTPS, then anyone in between you and the server could change the data. So a, a person running a server in the middle or a router could add malware to the page that you see. That's why HTTP is really a bad idea and modern browsers will increasingly just pop up warning messages and tell you not to use unencrypted websites. They're just sort of dangerous and unsanitary and almost everybody is abandoning them. Anyway, let's take a look at the next Kahoot would be here. All right. And so this should be 129S3B. Good. Looks like things are working. Good. All right.
feel better. I got my system working better. Oh, I think the problem before I have a, a docking station that adds a couple extra monitors and it's not an Apple product. And I think I've learned that any kind of extenders that don't come from Apple eventually cause trouble on iOS on OS 10 rather. I got four extra monitors on my laptop and uh, now I've taken that down to two, but they're all going through official Apple adapters. So. I think I'm going to have to settle for three external monitors to have a system that's stable enough. All right. I think we can go. All right. What request header tells it the page you are coming from? Okay, that's the referrer. Good. Not the host. The host is the, the server you're trying to reach. All right. So how do you say that a cookie should always be encrypted? Okay, it's in the set cookie header. When you set a cookie, you can add the secure flag to it. And then the browser will be told to mark it and never send it except over HTTPS. All right, and what status code indicates the page is not found? Okay, that's 404. I think everybody knows that. All right. And what transport protocol does HTTPS use? Okay, that's it. TLS these days. It used to be SSL, but now it's TLS. All right, clickers, I know who that is. Cookie Monster will have to tell me who they are. Kunal is a real name, I think. All right. So there's one more section. Lecture is a little longer than usual today, but I think I'll stick with it. So I want to go back to here and I should be able to share the keynote. Ah, sharing is working just right now. Good. So uh, here's how the web works. You could have static pages that are just HTML and images that just sit there, um, like my page, but most everybody has dynamic content now where it reads cookies from you and it decides what to share you. For example, at least it shows you different ads on every page. This is why one crazy thing I've seen, I think everyone has seen, if I buy something on Amazon, like a pair of shoes, for the next week, every website will try to sell me those same shoes, which is pretty stupid. But you know, obviously they're reading the cookie and have a very dumb script because I obviously don't want another pair of the same shoes. At least it should show me something related, but different. But anyway, um, all right, so your parameters can be sent uh, in the URL query string after a question mark or in the path if it's rest or in cookies or in the body of the request, all ways to send some data along with your request. 
Yeah, share your data like WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, WhatsApp and Facebook, everybody's selling your data. Anyway, so um, the server-side application can read any part of the request as an input. It can read the user agent or anything else. Um, so it passes it to some kind of script on the server, which might be in PHP or Perl or any of a lot of languages like ASP. Um, it has a web server, which is the most popular ones are Apache and IIS. And then it's got databases full of information about customers and passwords and credit card numbers and a lot of other things back there, directory services, a whole bunch of servers all working together. And the page you see is assembled from pieces from all these little technologies. Java is the standard for large scale enterprise applications. And I've seen pages that say the uh, most in demand coding language that has the highest pay is Java because it's pretty hard to write stuff in Java, but you have to use Java if you really wanna scale out to a big cluster of a thousand servers serving a large number of, cust of customers. Um, so enterprise Java Bean is used here and they use plain old Java objects for lightweight objects and Java servlets are the objects on a server that take HTTP requests and return responses. And there's a Java web container like Apache Tomcat that runs these things. And all right. And then um, you have other components that are used alongside the code, which by the way, gives rise to supply chain attacks. The SolarWinds attack just hit the news recently. Many people are using this product from SolarWinds and it turned out to have uh, malware in it. And this happens to a lot of people because if you use some uh, language like PHP or Python or Java, you include library codes and that library code comes from some other server written by somebody else. And how do you know that stuff is secure? And how do you know somebody didn't put malicious code in there? And the answer is you don't. And an increasing number of people are worrying about the supply, these supply side attacks where you really should be able to make a list of where every component you're using came from and some kind of measure of whether there's a known vulnerability in it. Uh, the more people think about how many other people you're trusting when you use these platforms, the more they get concerned. So anyway, um, here's some of the third party components that are often used with Java. And then there's ASP. This is Microsoft competitor to Java. So if you use Microsoft Windows servers, and this is Microsoft scripting language, and this uses .NET Framework, which is really popular and lets you write your code in a variety of different languages like C Sharp or Visual Basic. Um, and so you use Visual Studio, the main programming environment. And we're using it in the uh, malware analysis class to write little programs and analyze their security consequences. And so you can use ASP.NET to make web applications quite easily in a nice graphical environment. And it will, the platform will protect you from some mistakes. And PHP is the open source product intended to make it really easy to quickly customize a page. I use it quite a bit. PHP is notorious for security problems. WordPress runs on PHP. The, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with PHP. It's just that in practice, if you have a PHP website, it doesn't take long before somebody makes a mistake. There are common mistakes. The most common mistake with PHP is uh, file inclusion vulnerabilities. People often put a file name in a parameter and then you can just give it a different file name or a different path to a different location and refer to another file. That's very common with PHP. It's not an intrinsic problem with language, but it is a common mistake. So uh, many things are written with PHP, like PHP admin and Squirrel Mail. And as I mentioned, WordPress, there's just a lot of PHP based software out there because it's easy to write, but they typically have a long series of security flaws and patches. Ruby on Rails, haven't heard that much about it lately, but for a while people used Ruby on Rails a lot. Another alternative. And SQL is huge. Whatever you do, you have a huge list of products or customers or employees or something like that. And you have to keep all that data and constantly update it and constantly use it. So you have a database server just to manage all that data. And you can use Oracle or Microsoft SQL or the open source MySQL. Um, now called MariaDB, I think. And you send queries up in this structured query language to read data, modify data, and so on. We're going to um, spend quite a while working with SQL injection. What languages are most important for cybersecurity experts to know? Well, there's no simple answer. You should know some coding language. Um, 
so I would recommend if you don't know any coding, learn Python and bash shell scripting. That's the minimum. Uh, then the more is better. Um, I think uh, there's no simple answer for that, but uh, if um, we're not having a job fair this semester, which is kind of too bad because that was one good way to get an answer there. But at the job fair, they really wanted people that could program Python. That was probably the most common request I've heard lately. Um, but if you don't wanna be a coder for a living, as a security professional, you don't really know all the tricks of writing code. You just know the security problems and how to patch them. And I think you really need to know one language to understand that, but there are so many languages, there are new ones all the time. Um, I'd say just learn one language so you have something to work from. Cybersecurity is a vast domain. Yeah, yeah, there's no simple answer. I mean, there's many different areas, but certainly you don't wanna be someone who can't program at all, or you're really not gonna be able to understand what you're doing trying to protect uh, code. So anyway, SQL, you store your data in tables and you send um, requests up to change the data. And we'll look at that a little later. Then there's XML, where you encode data like this. You use less than and greater than signs to define these fields. So it's like an HTML web page, pet, ginger, pets, dog, spot, cat. You know, you have containers, opening and closing tags. It's just a way to format data to send it up to a server. And then you got SOAP. SOAP uses HTTP and XML. So you send the data up with an HTTP request and what you send up is XML. It's just a way to format data to move it over a network. And the SOAP response looks like this. Here's the response, here's the quotation, you know, very much like HTTP requests and response. And so if you have user supplied data in there, as I mentioned before, you can have code injection vulnerabilities if you allow the user to stick in special characters like less than and greater than. And uh, it uses web services description language to describe what's available on your server. All right, so I got some cahoots about this. And then there's one more section after this. Uh, here are my cahoots, good. And this should be 3C, which is here. Okay. Do I think Zoom has security problems? Oh, Zoom had a lot of security problems, actually. Uh, with the chat feature, there was one where you could like type code in the chat and execute it, but they patched it. There might be more. But oh, yes, Zoom had quite a few security problems about six months ago. Some people actually freaked out and quit using Zoom. I think one that they got mad about, you could put a link in the chat and if people clicked it, it could expose a local file on their machine. That's another one. Looks like we're going. All right. All right. What what is a POJO? What's that used by? Okay, that's plain old Java object. All right. All right, how about LAMP servers? What do they use? Okay, hey, that's uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. The common open source choice is what I use most of the time. All right, what system looks like that? That's XML. 
looks sort of like HTML. All right, and what uses WSGL? Yeah, that's SOAP, Web Services Description Language. All right, Cookie Monster. You better tell me who they are if they want their points. And clickers, I know who that is. Okay, good. I think clickers is one every time so far. Good. All right. So we got one more section of this to look at. Aha, Quickie Monster has revealed their identity. Good. All right. Good, then I can give you your points. All right. Let me go back to my slides. Make sure here. Ah, it's working so well now. Okay. So in the browser, you get HTML, which is the language used to describe the web page. And XHTML is a later version of HTML um, intended to be a little stricter. Fixing that typo. So, all right. So you got hyperlinks. You can have an href equals something. And then when you click it, it will go there. What's inside the quotes will be used as the URL to go to. And you can have forms that take data like, let me get rid of this thing here. Here, name and password. And I still didn't get rid of that thing. Fine, I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, so you have input fields and it goes to a script. So when they give you, click in the name and password and click submit, it will go to the server and run this PHP script, which will get that data and do whatever it wants to with it. So it will send an HTTP request. Now, if I use a method of get here, it will take the name and password and it will put it right up here in the URL, which I mentioned before is not a good practice because if you saved a favorite or it went to a server log, this would be stored there and it would include a password, but you can do it and the server will understand it and let you log in. Um, another way to do it is use method equals post and encoding type multi-path form data to send this data. And then the browser will generate these random lines, WebKit form boundary around the blocks of data with these long random letter strings in it. I don't know why it does that, but that's what it does. The cascading style sheets are used to lay out web pages. They don't contain active code. They have presentation information like what color to make and what borders to put around a table and such. JavaScript is the script that runs in your browser. And it used to be that JavaScript was used only for very simple things like checking a form field to see if it had the right number of letters in it or something. But about 10 years ago, um, Firefox and Chrome decided to see if they could make JavaScript run better. And they found out that the JavaScript engines in browsers was spectacularly inefficient and they made it 100 times faster. So now you could really use JavaScript to do a lot of cool things and for a while, Internet Explorer was miserable and you couldn't do it. And Microsoft was shamed into improving their engine too. So that's why for the last five years or so, the hottest language for developers is JavaScript. And you have these JavaScript-based frameworks that people are using like crazy um, uh, to make advanced web pages, nice dynamic web pages. VBScript was Microsoft's attempt to make a competing product for JavaScript. It ran only in Internet Explorer. It wasn't used very much, and even Microsoft has finally given up on it. Um, they, Microsoft does this a lot. They make a product, they try to charge into somebody else's domain, and their product is just not very good, and eventually they give up. They did it with Silverlight, too, try to compete with Flash. So in, there's a document object model you, in, in your browser. You have a document. It has a root element. Then it has elements underneath it, like a title, and then a tag, an ahref tag, and then a link. So you can refer to a tree structured series of objects and sub objects to refer to every element on the page. So now you could read the data that was typed in a field, or change the data in a field or other things like that. And this is how you manipulate things in JavaScript, you describe it all with this document object model. So there's a simple page with a script here. And see, instead of this hello world does not appear 
directly in the body of the page, like you might think. Instead, there's a paragraph with an ID called demo, and there's a JavaScript. And this takes the item named demo and sets its inner HTML to hello world. So this is how you can use a script to actively change content on a page. And of course, it gets much, much bigger with uh, fancy JavaScript frameworks. Ajax is asynchronous JavaScript and XML, and that's what's used so you can refresh just part of a page instead of the whole page. And so if you take um, Google Maps and you drag it over you, and you turn on Wireshark to watch the request, you'll see all these little gets with these long parameters. If I drag it to the left, it will get like the next quarter inch here, just the little rectangle there to refresh the page with a separate get request. And that's the, the beauty of Ajax. You can get just a little bit of data at a time, which makes the page much more responsive. So another way to send data is JavaScript object notation, where it looks like this with the curly braces. And now you have name value pairs with colons. Uh, you could have done this with XML. It's just another way to uh, indicate the structure of data. So you can update data with JSON. You define a contact object and then do a post to update it. So here is the JSON data that's going to update my uh, information on the server, like my name, ID, and email. All right, I mentioned before the same origin policy means that the cookies from one website will only uh, be sent back to request to that same website. So scripts on Facebook can't write to the data on your banking page. When this process fails, and it fails a lot, then you have cross-site vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and so on. All right, here's the formal description of it, that a page on one domain cannot modify cookies in another domain or load script in another domain, and so on. HTML5 is the new technology, well, not that new anymore, but it replaces um, Flash and lets you have movies on pages and so on. And web 2.0 is the modern web where people authenticate and have all these advanced features running on websites, which are now far more complicated than they used to be when they were just static HTML. These browser extensions have kind of come and gone. People had client-side Java, ActiveX, Flash objects, and Silverlight. Uh, they were very insecure and they pretty much all been replaced by HTML5 and are just more and more restricted. Um, all right, so you've got a session held primarily by cookies, as we talked about. And so you can encode things. If I want to send a space up to a server, I can put, um, this is the hexadecimal version of it. And so if I want to send this character, character 20, this is the uh, printable ASCII characters from 20 in hexadecimal to 7E which is 32 to 126. Um, so if I want to send other characters, I have to encode them. So percent 3D is how an equals goes. Percent 25 is a percent. Percent 20 is a space. There's a new line and a null byte. And then a, in the browser bar URL, you do them with a percent, a percent and then two characters. All right. And uh, so you can also use Unicode encoding. There are various versions of it, but the simplest one is just wide Unicode with 16 bits per character. So you do percent U and then four digits in hexadecimal to encode unusual characters like an E with the accent mark. And UTF-8 is the most modern and best system where you have a series of bytes and it can be a variable length. So this can really encode all the characters you need to encode for Chinese and Arabic and Japanese and hamburger icons and copyright symbols and smiley faces and just everything in UTF-8. So HTML encoding lets you have these ampersand and then a symbol and then a semicolon like a less than and greater than to encode these characters which is really important because then I can send up those characters and use them, but they will not be misunderstood as the beginning and end of HTML tags or XML tags. So this HTML coding is important to remove special characters so they don't have their special meaning. Um, and so you can also just use a numerical code. A ampersand pound and then a number semicolon will encode any number you want any character you want by number. 
the more common ones have these alphabetical descriptions like quote and apostrophe, but the other ones you can refer to by number. Base64 encoding takes a string of data, which is always a string of bits, and groups it six bits at a time instead of eight bits at a time, so that the characters are always <coughs> chosen from these 64 characters, capital letters, lowercase letters, digits, and plus and slash. That's a total of 64 characters. These are all just different ways of representing data that goes to the server. Then there's hex encoding. You just take each character and turn it into two digits of hex. So an A is 41 because it's ASCII 65. This is 416 plus 10. That's a B and that's a C. So you can encode things that way and send it up to server. Anyway, um, there's also serialization, which we'll talk about. You'll see quite a bit of it in the um, uh, Port Swigger security course. Serialization is where you take a blob of data and encode it into one object and then send it to the server where it is unserialized. And this turns out to have a lot of vulnerabilities, but it is used by Java and by a lot of other technologies. All right. And so uh, anyway, um, I think I'm not going to bother with that one. We'll just do the last Kahoot here, which is, I need to share it from here. Okay, share. There it is. And there should be a 3D. And there it is. Good. All right. There we go. Good. All right, looks like I got some people. All right, what system defines formats like that? That's cascading style sheets. All right. Which one of these is obsolete? Good. VB script, competitor to JavaScript, now obsolete. All right, which system requests a little bit of data from the server, but not the whole page? Okay, that's Ajax. And what system writes a space like that? Okay, that's HTML encoding. All right. All right, I know who that is. I know who that is. And I know who that is, good. All right, so I've recorded those scores 
And I think I'm going to stop this recording.